So uh, let's start off and talk about uh, the economy a little bit. And uh, obviously, we've been on a good long run here. A very long run. And yet, does that surprise you? And what would be the signs that you would look for to see that things were winding down? Well, I look at a lot of figures just in connection with our, our businesses. I, I, uh, I like to get numbers. <laughs> so so I, I'm, I'm getting reports in weekly in some businesses. Uh, uh, that, but that doesn't tell me what the economy is going to do six months from now or three months from now. It, it tells me what's going on now with our businesses. Uh, uh, and it really doesn't make any difference in what I do today in terms of buying stocks or buying businesses, what those numbers tell me. They're interesting, but they're not, they're not guides to me. Uh, if, if we buy a business, we're going to hold it forever. So we're, we're going to have good years, bad years, in between years, maybe a disastrous year some year. <laughs> and, and, uh, we, we care a lot about the price. We do not care about the next 12 months. But are you surprised at how long this economy has been expanding? I've been surprised by all kinds of things in the last 10 years about the economy. I mean, I, uh, I don't think there was any economist I've ever read that uh, talked about negative interest rates uh, for long periods of time. I mean, if you go back and read Keynes or you read, uh, you read Samuelson, you read any of them, they do not get into a negative rate environment. I think now there's still 11 trillion that's, uh, of government debt around the world that's at a negative rate. So we've never seen it before. And we've never seen at least the conventional wisdom on a sustained period of long and growing deficits while the economy is getting better, extremely low interest rates, and really very little inflation. So something different is happening, but something different happens all the time. So, uh, uh, and that's one reason economic predictions just don't enter into our decisions. Charlie Munger, my partner, and I, in you know, 54 years now, we've never made a decision based on an economic prediction. We make business predictions about what individual businesses will do over time, and we compare that to what we have to pay for them. But we have never said yes to something because we thought the economy was going to do well in the next year or two years, and we've never said no to anything because we were right in the middle of a panic even, if the price was right. All right, so you don't pay much attention to the dismal scientists then, I guess. Well, I pay none in the sense of, as a, as a guideline to doing anything. I, it's entertainment, I mean, you know, it's like going to a variety show or something like that. But, uh, and I just don't know of any economist that, that actually has bought businesses successfully, uh, successfully or, or, or done well in stocks, Paul Samuelson did. And as you may know he was a big shareholder of Berkshire. But, but uh, it's, you know, they, they make guesses and the, there's so many variables. I mean, in, in the hard sciences, you know, you know that, you know, if an apple falls from a tree, that it isn't gonna change over the centuries because of anything or political developments or 400 other variables that go in. But when you get into economics, uh, there's so many variables and and the truth is, you've got to expect good times and bad times in business. And if you, if you were to buy an auto dealership and you're, you know, wherever you live locally or a McDonald's franchise or anything like that, you wouldn't try and time the purchase. You'd try and make the right purchase at the right price and you want to be sure you got a good business. But you wouldn't say, I'm going to buy it because growth this year is going to be 3% instead of 2.8% or something of the sort. Fair enough. You have over a hundred billion dollars of cash. Um, Berkshire does. Berkshire. Yeah, no, you're, you're yeah. Much yeah. Maybe you do. Um, you have, Berkshire has over a hundred billion in cash, and you say that you always want this company to be a fortress. So, how much cash should an ordinary investor have on a percentage basis? Do you think it, it depends on their personal situation? I mean, it. 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 Uh, it if, you, if, you, if you're working in something where you're, you're living off your, your, your paycheck from, from week to week, you want to have a little cash around, and, and you certainly don't want to have a credit card that's maxed out or anything like that. Uh, but if, you know, if, if your house is paid off, if you don't have big living expenses, you got a portfolio of, of decent, diversified businesses, uh, you don't really need any cash. So you can be more cash-free than Berkshire is? 
yeah, yeah, I've got responsibility. You know, we've got insurance claims. We could have hurricanes that, you know, would happen. Uh, all kinds of things where you might have to pay out billions of dollars. And I've got over a million people that own shares that are counting on me to run the place so we get through periods like that. But if I were retired, I had a, say, a million dollar portfolio of stocks that was paying me 30000 a year in dividends or something of the sort. And my children had grown, the house was paid off and everything. But, uh, you know, I wouldn't worry too much about having a lot of cash around. Let's talk a little bit about Apple. Everyone always wants to talk about Apple, right? It's kind of the it stock, the it company. Um, you have a $45 billion stake, more or less. It was up, now it's down. You're still in the money. Um, how, how closely do you follow the company? You know, people are concerned they haven't really introduced any new products. Well, if you have to closely follow a company, you shouldn't own it. You really? Know. No, I mean, if you, I mean if, you, if you buy a business, if you buy a farm, you know, do you go up and look? you know, every couple of weeks to see how far the corn is up and, uh, you know, you worry too much about whether somebody says this is going to be a year of low prices because exports are being affected or anything like that. You know, you buy a farm and you hold it for, I've got one farm that I bought in the 1980s and my son runs it, but I've, I've been there once, you know, I mean, it, 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 it doesn't grow faster if I go and stare at it, you know, I can't cheer for it, you know, more effort, more effort or something like that. And I know there's going to be some years when prices are going to be good and some when the prices aren't going to be good. I know there's years when yields will be better than others, but I bought the farm. And, and uh, if it, it just doesn't, I don't care about economic predictions on it or anything of the sort. I do care that over, over the years it's well tended to in, in terms of rotating crops. And I hope yields get better, which they generally have. In fact, that farm 100 years ago would have probably produced 30 bushels maybe 35 bushels of corn per acre. And now in a good year, you know, it'd be 200. I mean, we've really made progress in this country. That's one reason commodity prices, if you go back a couple hundred years, they've moved so little is because we've just gotten better and better at whether it's cotton or whether it's, it's corn or soybeans or all kinds of things. And you and I have benefited from that. And so Apple is kind of like a farm. Well, it's, it's a, it's a long term investment and, and if you owned, if you owned the, the best auto dealership in town, uh, the best brand, and had a, somebody good running it, you wouldn't drop by every day and say, you know, how many people have come in today, or, you know, I think interest rates are going up a little, maybe it'll slow down our sales or anything. No, you buy it knowing there's 365 days a year, and you're going to own it for 20 years, so that's 7,300 days, and you know they're going to, things are going to be <laughs> different from day to day and year to year. You shouldn't buy it if the day to day stuff is important. Let's switch uh, over to talk about buybacks, which is another hot topic these days. And and you did a fair amount. If you look in the annual report, you can see that between December 13th and, and 24th. Um, it looks like you guys bought back about $233 million worth of Berkshire, which was right near that particular stock market bottom. How did you know that? Or well, that, I, What was going through your mind? If I knew it, I'd have bought a lot more than 200 million. No, that, that's not a big purchase for us, actually. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, no, we will buy Berkshire when we have lots of excess cash. All of the needs of the business are taken care of. We spent $14 billion on property, plant, and equipment last year, way more than depreciation. So we take care of the needs of the business. Then we have excess cash. And if we find invest, what we'd love to do is find other businesses to buy. But if our stock, if I think the stock, and my partner Charlie Munger think the stock is selling uh, below intrinsic business value, uh, we will buy in stock. So it obviously was at that point. Well, we, we thought so, yeah, yeah. But, but uh, you know, what's really intriguing is, is when it goes down a lot. I mean, uh, and when, when you're buying dollar bills for, for 60 or 70 cents, which periodically you get a chance to do in stocks, then, yeah, you know, assuming you've got the, the cash, you don't want to ever, you know, get so that, uh, that some, some surprise could really take you out in some way. But if we've got excess cash, we'll buy it as fast as we can. But at that point, it would be more like a 2009 rather than just yeah. December. Yeah, just yeah, exactly. It, uh, but it's, you know, if you and I own a McDonald's franchise together and it's worth a million dollars and you own 50% of it and you come to me and you say, I'll sell out for 400000 
you know, I'll buy you out. If you say six hundred, I'd be wary of that. But yeah, well, well, you should be. Reason. You should be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but if you want six hundred thousand, know, I'll just say <laughs> come back tomorrow. <laughs> um, so, just continuing about buybacks, Senator Schumer and, and Sanders um, want the government to weigh in to sort of legislate when companies can do buybacks. Um, and then also there was a report recently about executives doing insider trading, it appears, around the times of buybacks. So are buybacks a kind of a problem? Well, you'll have some people that misbehave and respect them, any activity. I mean, uh, so the, it really wouldn't have much to do with buybacks. I, I think buybacks, the degree to which they've been part of nefarious activity, uh, and I've observed them for a lot of years, and are very close to zero. But, but that just may be that there aren't enough opportunities. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, that that article did not, uh, uh, I, I didn't follow the conclusion on it. I mean, you're distributing money to shareholders, essentially, you can do it by dividends, and presumably American business should distribute money to its owners <laughs> occasionally. And uh, we, do it, we do it through buybacks, or we've done some, and we don't do it through dividends, and, uh, but most companies do it through having a dividend policy. And then if they have money beyond the needs of the business, then I think if their stock is underpriced, then it makes nothing but sense. Should the government tell companies when to do it or at least mandate conditions where they can? Well, they, they do restrict you a little in terms of uh, if you're uh, some general rule of the SEC, if you're having some kind of, uh, this isn't quite the right word, but manipulative activity or anything like that in the stock. But no, I don't think the, I don't think the government should decide your dividend policy. I don't even think they should direct your capital investments. They can make it enticing to make certain kinds of invest, uh, capital investments, which they do with renewable energy, for example. I mean, the government has interest in fostering certain developments in this country over time, and they do, there used to be a special oil depletion allowance, you know, 50 years ago and so on. Uh, that was more politics than it was governmental policy, but certainly renewables are a prime example of that. But the idea of, decide, of directing whether you are entitled to return cash to shareholders and the manner in which you do it, I don't think really makes a lot of sense. The 2020 election is going to be upon us before we know it. And um, I know that you had some nice things to say about Mike Bloomberg, but it appears he is not going to be running now. Yeah, it's, it's hard to win with just the billionaire vote. But I, I admire him enormously. I wish he had run. I, I want to be very clear on that. We have Howard Schultz potentially running. Uh, President Trump was a business executive. So two questions. Is a business executive the right kind of person to be president? And what characteristics do you look for for a president that you would support? Well, I, I think a business executive can be the right person, but I don't, I don't think that because they're a business executive that, that you give them extra points. Uh, and n number one, I want, a, I want a president that wakes up every morning and, and realizes that the greatest threat to a country which has got all kinds of things going for it are weapons of mass destruction. And that we live in a world where uh, people, organizations, and occasionally countries uh, uh, could have uh, people that would like to wipe out a large percentage of the American people, or maybe other countries as well. And that you now have capabilities, which I always thought until recently I, I classified as nuclear, chemical, and biological, but I think you have to add cyber now. I, uh, you know, if you, if you have some evil genius someplace that, that for crazy reasons, just like uh, you know, happened with anthrax back, you know, who knows what motivates somebody that starts sending anthrax out in my letters. And if you have somebody that thinks that it'd be great to send a false alarm to the Soviet, or to the Russians and to the U.S. that the other side was launching or something of the sort. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a very, very dangerous world. It's a wonderful world, but it has dangers now that started in August of 1945 and when Einstein said, you know, this changes everything in the world except how men think. And, and uh, so I want a president that has that same filter that all of these other things are important, but protecting the country and reducing the chance of successful use of weapons of mass destruction against us is the number one job. And I think 
I think most of the presidents, I've talked to a couple of them about it in, over the years, and I, I, I really think that they do realize that they may get lost in the events of every day as they go along. And then beyond that, I want a president that has two objectives with the economy. One is to make sure that this marvelous goose we have keeps laying more golden eggs. And then I want a president that also feels that if GDP is $60,000 per capita in the United States, that nobody should get left behind. We've got a market system that works marvelously in turning out more goods and services, uh, better ones, year after year. Done it all through my life. Uh, it does not, it also has the, as a, we have a system that the people who don't fit the market system in terms of their talents, they may have been perfectly good to land on the beaches of Normandy and all of that sort of thing, but they don't have, they just don't have that kind of talent, just like I don't have any athletic talent. You know, I mean, if I had to live in an athletic universe, you could train me eight hours a day and I could read diligently at night. And I, I, wouldn't do any good. I, I just get out there and fumble the ball or whatever would happen. So, so we have to take care of the people that the market system doesn't take care of while it's spewing out huge riches for the people who do fit well. And, and that could be done. Would you ever talk to a candidate and say, hey, what do you think about these three things? Well, They'll tell me what I want to hear. <laughs> so I, I want to hear what they tell people who disagree with them on the subject. I, I, I always like to ask a candidate, uh, they usually finesse me some way or another, but I say, what are you for that the majority of your followers are against? You know, I know you really believe in that. <laughs> you know, and that's really the test, but I'm not sure that, except under some kind of sodium pedophile or something, <laughs> you're not going to get a great answer to that question. That's great, but that's the question you ask the presidential candidates or presidents that you speak to. It, if, if I really want to get, and it's, that's why Bernie Sanders was so successful. I mean, 90% of the people who voted for Bernie Sanders had probably not heard of him two years earlier, but they felt they, they, knew, exactly, they, felt they knew exactly what he would do. I mean, they felt he was authentic. And, and if, if you asked him, you know, what he was for that most people might be against, he would tell you, you know. Um, a few questions about Kraft Heinz. Um, I know you say you learn from your mistakes. Do you think that mm. was a mistake? I'd, I'd rather learn from other people's mistakes, actually. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, was that a mistake? Well, we'll find out over time. But, but we did pay too much, in my view, for... for uh, for Kraft, we didn't pay too much for Heinz. Uh, uh, so when we started out, it was originally a non-public partnership between us, and, and uh, but we did pay uh, too much, in my view, uh, for Kraft. And there's not much you can do about things if you pay too much. Uh, and uh, secondly, there's always been a struggle between the retailer and brands. I mean, if, if I've got a terribly weak brand and I want to get into Walmart, I'm not going to be able to do it. You know, I mean, I have to offer all kinds of crazy concessions, you know, that, that, and I want to be in Walmart if I, got, I have some sort of consumer packaged goods. The negotiation is way different if you have something essential versus non-essential. Ten years ago, Costco tried to get rid of Coca-Cola. Costco's got terrific loyalty among customers and, you know, and, uh, and their own Kirkland brand is a $39 billion brand now and it moves from category to category and they only started in 1992. So they, they know brands and they, and, but in the end, they put Coca-Cola back in. Uh, if it had been Royal Crown Cola, <laughs> they wouldn't have had to put it back in. Uh, uh, so there's always that struggle between the brands. I mean, and, 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 and there always will be. But the retailers net it has been moving in their direction, uh, particularly I think because of the Amazon revolution. Uh, First Walmart, and then yeah, well, yeah, Walmart, right, then Walmart, then yeah. I mean, it, uh, uh, but it's been accentuated. Yeah. I think uh, we have a new retailing environment now. I mean, it is. It isn't like it goes from night to day, but it, it, it moves somewhat. And, and uh, brands that people have spent billions of dollars developing and sponsoring TV shows or sponsoring radio shows in the old days. I mean, Campbell's Soup was always on there with Jack Benny or something, you know, when I was a kid. And, and it was big. Uh, and it built brands. 
and people like obviously like the product too but people are more willing to change and it's harder it's it's it's, it's a somewhat different world than what it is night and day i mean you are very unlikely to keep changing brands every day but it really surprised me that that gillette lost position i mean I, Men don't like men don't like to experiment much. Women are better at experimenting. But you know, if, if a kid, if, when you were a kid, the Gillette Cavalcade of Sports was your pal and brought you the Rose Bowl and you know the World Series and all that sort of thing, you didn't. You just shaved with Gillette the rest of your life, <laughs> and uh, and and you still do to a great degree. But it's not exactly the same as it was even five years ago or so when we bought Kraft. You mentioned Amazon as a game changer, and I have to ask you, you haven't bought the stock, you're an admirer of Jeff Bezos, a, a listing of the richest people in America came out, he's number one, I think your friend Bill Gates is number two, you're number three, so you can see what he's done in myriad ways, yeah. and of course the question is, how come you haven't bought Amazon, is there still time to buy, would you still buy it? Oh, I, I always admired Jeff, I mean I met him 20 years ago or so, and and, and I thought he was something special, but I didn't realize you could go from books to what, what's happened there. No, I, I mean, he had a vision and executed it in an incredible way, something that it, it would not have, you know. That, but there's a lot of games I miss. I, I would have missed, you know, I would have missed Microsoft even if I got into no bill earlier or something. Those just aren't my games. I don't worry about the things that I miss that are outside my circle of competence of, of evaluating. I, I do, I have missed things that were within my circle, and that's a terrible mistake. Those are my biggest mistakes, you haven't seen them. And, but I don't, it's not a mistake because I miss Netscape or something like that at all. There, I would say that maybe 5% of the companies or 10% of the companies at most are within an area of my circle of competence. There's something I should be able to understand. So I want to get back to that trend thing you were just talking about. How do you recognize when a giant trend is over? And you know, you're, you're right, obviously, that over time things don't change that much, but sometimes they do. Like newspapers was a business that you admired for so long. It's not a good business. No, news, newspapers went, if you're the only one in town, in other words, some competitive situations, but it was survival of the fattest. Whichever, whichever paper was the fattest won because it had the most ads in it, and ads are news to people. I mean, they, they want to know what, what supermarkets having the bargain on Coke or Pepsi this weekend and so on. I mean, it, 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 it upsets the people in the newsroom to talk that way, but, but the ads were the most important editorial content from the standpoint of the reader. Uh, overall, in any big daily, I mean, if you were looking for a job, you had one place to basically to look, and that was the classified section. If you were looking for an apartment to rent, and you know those, those, those pages were just dozens and dozens of pages. That's that's disappeared. I mean, the essential the things that are essential to you. News is what you don't know that you want to know, and you know what happened in national sports. Uh, you know. The moment it happens, and you can go watch video of it, and so on. You can go to you know ESPN and see what's going on. In that you know what's happening in politics. You know what's happening in, in the stock market. I used to look at the stock market pages the next morning, you know, when I, before I delivered the papers, I <laughs> I, I checked them out. Uh, the, the world has changed hugely, and and it did it gradually. It went from monopoly to franchise to competitive to toast. Uh, toast. Yeah, and and. Sodas, kind of like that too. I mean, they're still around, but that's a no. They're disappearing. Right. They're going to disappear. Yeah. And, and so uh, New York Times won't. The Washington Post won't. The Wall Street right. Journal won't. Right. All right. Well, let me let me switch gears then and ask you about leverage a little bit. And corporate debt, people are concerned about. People are concerned about federal debt at twenty-two trillion dollars. Um, should we reduce, let's just say, the federal debt? And how would we do that? Well, if you're running a deficit getting close to 5% when things are really good, you know, it, that's a new world. Um, and, uh, for, and, and nobody's, neither the Republicans or Democrats are particularly concerned about it. And we're not having a lot of inflation. That wasn't supposed to happen, you know, but it's happening. That's why I say you don't really, you don't want to get hung up on trying to make economic analysis because you know, no, nobody's any good at, nobody, you don't get rich doing that. <laughs> it, uh, 
If you look at, you mentioned that Forbes list, if you get on the list, the number of people who have done that by economic analysis, I think you're just about zilch on there. Okay, fair enough. Um, income inequality, wealth inequality, you've talked about the earned income tax credit. Is there more to it than that? Should we adjust tax policy? It seems to be going the other way right now. Well, it is going the other way, but I think, I think, I think the earned income tax credit is the best way to put money in the pockets of people that don't fit well into the market system, but that are perfectly decent citizens and that have made a good bit of the success, something like I've had with Berkshire or something possible. It wouldn't have happened without the America we have. And if you go back, go back 200 years and we're all working on, 80% of us are working on farms. The person that's the best at that, working on that farm, whatever it may be, uh, uh, is worth maybe twice the ones that's the worst. You know? I mean, that's the difference between super talent and no talent in the farm economy, picking cotton or whatever it may be. Now, if you're the best middleweight fighter in the world, you, know, you may get 20 or $30 million. And, and, and if you are just a good citizen, raise nice kids, help in the neighborhood and everything else, but you don't have market-related skills. You'd be, you'd be good on that farm still, and you would be earning something comparable to most of the people around you. But you don't have something now that as it gets more and more specialized, and it's gonna to continue to get more specialized. You want two things for that person. You want them to have a decent life. I mean, they live in a country with 60,000 of GDP per person. You want, them to, you want them to have a decent life, and they can. I also think you want them to have a feeling of accomplishment. So you want them to have a job, assuming that they're not handicapped in some way. You want them to have a job. But the minimum wage would be one way to say, well, we'll make sure that they have enough money in their pocket. But that's got a lot of effects in disturbing the market system. They just need more cash. They don't need a higher wage. They need more cash in their pocket. And the government, at a relatively low cost, can provide a decent living for anybody that's living, that's working 40 hours a week and has a couple of children. And we've gone in that direction and it's sort of bipartisan. I mean, you find both Republicans and Democrats for it. I think it would be better not to have one annual payment, you know, that they get it monthly. And I think there's various things you could do, but you want it. You want them to feel part of the system and you want to get them, have them get as, as more and more of these golden eggs are laid, you want them to get Get, get a little more of their share. Yeah, I mean, if we don't do that and the Democrats win, it's possible we get, you know, big taxes on wealthy people, free college for all, and, and those are yeah, bigger just, plans. You want, you want more money in the pockets of, every, yeah. of everybody that's willing to work or is unable to work. And, and we can do it. A rich family would do that. You know, if I had six or seven kids and I had some business I wanted to pass on, you know, you'd pick the most able person to run it because that's the market system to do that but you'd make sure that all seven of the family participated. You'd, you'd give more to the one that, didn't. you might give more to the one that, that, that kept producing the golden eggs, and you would. But uh, you wouldn't just say to the, uh, you know, the one at the lowest end, who might be the best kid of all in, in most respects, you know, he's the one that shares with everybody and does all kinds of things. You, know, and, and you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't say to that, him or her, that, you know, too bad, but that's just the way the market system works, you know. But, uh, uh, go have your, have your spouse get a job and, you know, and look for housing someplace. Right. Um, why don't we do an update about the healthcare initiative, um, which now the company has a name. Yeah. We, Haven. Was that your idea? No. No. Sometimes no. I didn't worry about a name. I, I, we could have gone on as a no-name operation for 10 years as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> no. That, that is, we got a wonderful partnership in the sense that it's got lar it's large and has reasonable market muscle with a m more than a million employees, one of the three of us. We've got three CEOs that can make things get done in organizations that so are so big that normally they they wouldn't get very bureaucratic. On, you know, I mean, you know, if you tried to do this with many big companies, you'd have you'd have legal weighing in and you know and and, and, and public relations weighing in. You know, we don't have any of that stuff. They may have them in certain areas, but but I don't have to. But Jamie isn't going to worry about 
about you know, doing that sort of thing, and, and, and neither is Jeff. So, so we've got a unity of commitment uh, and an ability to execute on the commitment. The only problem is you know, you've got a $3.4 trillion industry, which is as much as the federal government raises every year, that, that basically is, feels pretty good about the system. They, as we went around talking to people to find a leader for the group, for example, you know, everybody says, you know, the system, you know, it, it, it turns out very good medicine, but you can't go from 5% of GDP to 18, you know, without, without really uh, making you less competitive, among other things in the world. So everybody thought the system needed some adjustment, just not their part of the system. And, and that's very human. I'd do the same thing, I'm sure, if I was in the same place. So it's, there's an enormous resistance to change, while a similar acknowledgement that change is, will be needed. And of course, if the private sector doesn't supply that over a period of time, you know, people will say then, you know, we give up, we gotta turn this over to government, which will probably be even worse. <laughs> How often do you talk to Jamie and Jeff about it? I know Todd Combs, I think. Yeah, Todd, right. Todd really does all the work at our budget. If this works, give Todd 100% of the credit <laughs> from, the, from the Berkshire standpoint. Do you talk to Dr. Gawande at all? I've talked to him once or twice. I'll, I'll tell you one interesting story about, about him, though. And I think it was a 2010. Uh, you know, I've got a partner, Charlie Munger, who's 95 now. But we both read The New Yorker. But we don't talk about it. And, and uh, one day, I, I'm talking to Charlie, and I say, I read this terrific article by a fellow I'd never heard of before. I probably didn't know how to pronounce his name then. I said, uh, and Charlie said, oh, he says, I sent him a check for $20,000 the other day. I read that article. It's the best article I've read in a long time. So I just thought, you don't get paid that much for being a writer at the New Yorker. So he actually just sent him off a check. So two guys 1,500 miles apart uh, both regarded that as one of the most interesting, informative Articles we'd we'd read and and similarly we followed them subsequently and met them and all, all that but but it wasn't my should take note. It's <laughs> a good article maybe Charlie Munger will send you well it is true that it. that if you read if you read three or four thousand words by somebody on an important subject and they really give you some insights or some factual background or something that you haven't seen in years and years of reading about it I mean they. They should make an impression. I mean, other people have made an impression I made through their writings. Um, does Haven have to buy companies to gain expertise? And what do you? No, it. it no, I, I don't think. What's the plan? I mean, I mean the, the plan is is to support uh, a very, very, very good thinker on this subject who's who wants is a practicing uh, physician and who commands the respect of the medical community. Uh, to, in effect, figure out some way so that we can deliver even better care uh, and have people feel better about their care, too. I mean, they have to perceive that they're receiving better care over time and, and, and stop the march upward uh, of cost relative to the country's output. But I mean, if you take 18 cents out of every dollar that, that you know, as a, a, of output in the United States and say it's going into health, that leaves 82 cents. And other countries are, are doing it for 10 or 11 cents when, if you go back to 1970, all of us were doing it for around five cents. So uh, we started from a fairly similar point compared to major industrial countries and, and it just keeps going up. And, and last year a corporate tax cut was put in for something that was 2% of GDP, <laughs> roughly, and people said, we can't be competitive, we have this 2% cost, you know, versus the rest of the world, and there's something that basically corporations pay in a very big way, and, and it's, it goes to 18, and I say it is a tapeworm of the US economy. We, the, we've got such a wonderful economy, we can do some very expensive things, I mean, but, and, but that doesn't mean we should. <laughs> doesn't mean, if you have a rich family, you still wanna be as efficient as you can. I'm, things generally, that's not the way all rich families feel, but it's the way at least one rich family I know <laughs> behaves. And, and that's, it just makes sense. We, we ought to, have to, we've got this incredible economic machine, but, but we, shouldn't, we shouldn't be spending 18% when other countries are doing something pretty comparable in terms of 
doctors per capita, hospital beds per capita, and all that. The very top stuff in medicine, I think, is very much concentrated in this country, and, and that's great. I want us to be the leader, but I just don't, I think we're paying a price. If we're paying seven extra points of GDP, that's 1.4 trillion a year, you know. At, uh, is the administration focusing, by focusing on drug prices, is that sort of a rabbit hole? Is that missing? No, I don't, I mean, they, they're, they're trying. <laughs> and, 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 and Congress generally, I mean, if you talk to the average congressman, uh, they, they, re, they regard it as a problem, uh, and, and, they may, they, and they see specific instances, you know, of drug prices or something like that. But it, 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 it's a big problem to change. I mean, the trouble is it intersects in so many ways, uh, and, that, it, uh, and that's why uh, we've got Gawande heading it, and we've got three biggest size organizations backing him. We're not trying to do it to make money. I mean, that is, that is not a goal that we end up with some business that, that uh, we make money off of. And will he be talking to health insurers, for instance? Well, he'll be, he'll be talking to everybody. But it's, it, it is, uh, uh, his game plan is not something we're going to try and lay out because it, it, it's in his head to some degree. I mean, obviously, we, we selected him uh, by, by hearing and, and reading and so on uh, uh, what he's done. But he'll learn as we go. We, we're con we'll, we will conduct certain experiments, or he will, you know, and, and try out a community where one of us has a lot of employees, maybe. And there's various ways to experiment. Why don't we take a little bit of a break? We'll be right back with Warren Buffett. All right, we're back with Warren Buffett. Warren, a few things from your um, shareholders yeah. there that I want to ask you about. You talked about the disparity in value between stakes in companies and wholesale takeovers, so that you were looking maybe to buy positions and stocks rather than buying whole companies because of the price differential. Why do you, why is that exist? What, can you explain that to well, us? Well, generally speaking, when companies are sold, they sell at premiums. Now, they sell at premiums because the, the buyer thinks they can do all kinds of wonderful things with it that the present manager isn't doing. I, I've often said that, you know, on the Fortune 500, maybe 250 companies should buy the other 250, and they just totally shift every year because everybody thinks they can run it better than the next guy, which is what you're saying when you, when you buy it in its entirety. Uh, I don't think we can run anything better than the people that are running when we buy it, so it's, it's hard for me to get to a premium, and the premiums have gotten more dramatic, and the leverage available has gotten uh, pretty generous, and that causes people to buy. People love to buy what they can't pay for. You know, basically, if somebody will also put up the money, and uh, and we don't we don't calculate leverage into any of our purchases. In other words, we don't say if we buy this thing for ten billion, we can borrow seven billion against it, because we're really using up Berkshire's general credit. I mean, I could apply seventy percent leverage to any one of our companies and make it look better, but. The, the truth is, it, 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 it's the general credit of Berkshire that's doing that, so it would be crazy to, just because I want to buy something, say, well, I'm buying this with 70% leverage, so therefore I can pay this kind of silly price. That, uh, but when, when, uh, when the CEO, well, you've got a huge bundle of money that's committed to buying something. They're getting paid a fee, tick, tick, tick every day to buy it. Now, they do get paid whether they buy it or not, things or not to some extent, which is uh, kind of an interesting business approach, but they do. Uh, but they also, let's just say there's a trillion dollars out there to do it, I don't know the figure. But beyond that, they're, they're probably, they probably put two trillion of leverage, they probably use two thirds leverage if they could, you know, on a purchase, something close to that. So you really got like three trillion of maybe purchasing power using these assumptions, which I know aren't correct, but they're in the general ballpark. Uh, well, three trillion. There's only 30 trillion of U.S. companies, you know, roughly, and and you know you can take Amazon and Apple and Berkshire, and they aren't for sale. So you got trillions that aren't. So the the demand supply is really really tilted. And it doesn't work in your favor. It works 100 percent against us because it uh, you know whenever whenever you've got somebody that gets paid for the upside. Uh, and, and locks up the money for 10 years, you know, or so. But, uh, uh, they've got every incentive to keep doing that. Tw 20 years ago, I had a fellow call me whose name you would know, and he said, Warren, I don't know anything about the reinsurance business. And he said, we've got this reinsurance company offered to us. 
and uh, big one, and he said, tell me what I should be looking at. And I, I went through a little bit of it. I said, but you're not going to learn that much about the reinsurance business by a phone call with me. And, and, you know, and uh, why, why, why are you looking at this? And he, he said, well, he said, we got to get the money invested in the next three months or we have to give it back. You know, and, and that's his equation. You know, and he's getting, and once he buys that company, he's got a fee built in for five years or whatever it may be, and he's got some of the upside, and he'd like upside, but if it doesn't work out, he still makes a lot, and gets very, very rich by anybody's standards. So it's, it's tough to compete with that. Right. Um, shifting gears, where do you find things like that Abe Lincoln tail and leg quotes? I mean, you read Bartlett's book of quotations. No, I don't read it, but uh, probably 50 years ago, I looked at a few Bartlett's quotations. But but I read I read a lot, and you just if you're these things and well, them. if you're 88 years old, I mean, you ought to remember something. Oh, well, you don't remember what happened yesterday, but you remember the old stuff. But, uh, uh, you know, you, you you've got a lot of interesting quotations in your head. You know, <laughs> you, not like you do. Uh, that's, that's great. Okay, um, I was looking at. Uh, uh, another topic completely. I was looking at the New York Times stock, and boy, it was I think three bucks in 2009. It's 30 bucks today, and noticing Carlos Slim, I think did pretty well. Very well. Were you interested in buying the New York Times? Did they approach you back then in 2009? It's it's been reported, uh, and it was in it's in this book that just just uh, came out by the former editor. Uh, There's just a little reference Jill to it. So, book. Yeah, Jill's uh, book, and and and. And it's, it's just touched on there, but uh, um, you know they were in trouble. A lot of companies were in trouble then. Uh, uh, now they've really they've hit on something online. I mean, they were late to the game on the online thing compared to the journal, but but they are they're really moving in, in online now, and uh, and and uh, they should be. I mean, they, they they've got. They, They've got the natural franchise for that, uh, and so their economic models worked out. And uh, I shouldn't go into any more detail on, <laughs> on history. <laughs> was your phone ringing off the hook around then? Well, it was ringing some, uh, but uh, it uh, yeah, it was ringing enough. I'll put it that way. And, and I mean. It, I ran out of money before it quit ringing. <laughs> wow. So one company you invested in um, was GE. Yeah. And you did well with that investment. And yeah. Yeah. I was too early, actually. If you look back, uh, I was very active in the last half of September and early October, and then I wrote that article in later October, and I knew it was going to get bad. I wrote the article was going to get bad, but I didn't think the stock market would react as much as it did between then and March. Uh, so uh, I, I had more or less used up our pow powder uh, well before the bottom was hit. That's interesting. How have you avoided not getting back into GE more recently? I mean, I'm sure that they've reached out to you. Everyone says, oh, why, why doesn't Warren Buffett invest yeah. in GE and save it and take it to the promised land? It's a well, great American company. Well, actually, uh, you know, I think Larry actually Doing a good job. I mean, that sale he made the other day uh, to, Danaher, to Danaher, yeah, Larry Hope, but to Danaher uh, is a good sale. And I think he's, his priorities are straight. And I think he's, I just, I just read the interview he did about two days, you know, a few days ago. And uh, uh, he is, he's a very able guy and he's on the right track. And I'm a, I'm a fan of GEs in the sense that, that, uh, we're a big buyer from them. We're a big seller to them. I've known the managers, you know. I mean, Jack Welch is a very good friend of mine. And we don't agree on politics 100 percent, but we have a lot of fun together. And I love the guy. <laughs> so I've got a great desire for GE to do well. It hasn't. It just hasn't looked that attractive to me. Right. Um, you talked about the groves of trees yeah. in the letters, shareholder. One was the third grove, which was sort of the in-between stakes. The yeah, the equity in interests. Yeah, were not. Is it, is it the case that those are sort of not the healthiest grove of trees? No. Why would that be? No, those are the, the pilot flying jays. Very, you know, they, they're, they're companies that under gap accounting, we have to record under an equity method. We own more than 20%, but we don't control them. And so it's, a, it, it's treated under gap accounting as a special category and, and, and it, it didn't fit well in the other grove, so I had to make it a separate grove by itself. 
it's not, it's, not, it's not that significant a grove. You say that the, the sum of Berkshire is, has a greater valuation than the part. That is true. Did you ever try to calculate that? How, how much is that? Well, it depends on circumstances. I mean, there's sometimes when the float from insurance can be very valuable. There's sometimes when the ability uh, to use production tax credits, we'll say, in the utility business, but have them on our, uh, as part of our consolidated return helps. But that varies a lot. It, 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 but it is a plus, uh, and uh, uh, we can move capital. Well, take a business like Seas Candy, which we bought 40 odd years ago. It's a wonderful little business. It throws up capital. We've tried 50 different ways to expand geographically, do all kinds of things. It doesn't work, and we'll try it again and it won't work. But uh, we can move that capital to buy, help buy BNSF Railroad or do all kinds of other things. So we've got a seamless and, 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 and tax efficient way of moving capital uh, where it's needed. And we've got some companies that really chew up capital and we got others that kick it off and, and, and uh, we can move it from one, one pot. If you try to do that with your investments, you, you incur some taxes as you go along doing it and uh, it, it's less efficient than what we've got. You talked a lot about um, the tax cuts and the benefits to Berkshire. You didn't really get into the costs of the tax cut, um, which surprised me a little bit. What, what are the other costs? I mean, is it just free money? Well, it makes a difference. Uh, the tax cut we get, for example, our utilities, as I mentioned in the report, that goes to the customers. That's just the nature of utility regulation. But, but net, we were a significant beneficiary uh, from the tax cut. I mean, basically, Let's just say we had one class of stock. We've got two, but stock. You and I own a business uh, together, and we think we own all the stock. But the tr truth is, before the tax cut, the government had a 35 percent uh, share of the stock on income. Now it didn't have a share of the assets, but it had a share of the income. And if it wanted to change it to 40, it could have changed it. But fortunately, it changed it to 21. <laughs> and if we had a private business, if we had a McDonald franchise together or an auto dealership together, you know. The third shareholder, that invisible shareholder, the governor, just handed us back a bunch of the shares of stock, and and uh, and, we, and our shareholders benefited, and a lot of other shareholders benefited. Right. You talked about uh, Ajit Jain and Greg Abel saying that Berkshire blood flows through their veins. Um, have they made a difference um, since uh, they become vice chairs? And then are they like Warren and Charlie? No, they, they don't. They don't have the interaction. They each run a separate business. Ajit does not think about the other businesses. He thinks about the insurance business. And Greg does not think about the insurance business at all. And, uh, and I think about the money and the capital and so on. Uh, but they, uh, they're running two very big businesses. I mean, Ajit's business you know, has, uh, you get all told, at least a couple hundred billion of assets. You know, and, and, and Greg's business has 150 billion of revenues. I mean, these are—they both would fit up there toward the top 10, you know, or so in the country at, uh, in terms of value. So uh, maybe the top 15. Uh, but they're—they're they're very big businesses. But they're not exactly like you two guys. It's oh no, no, no. Charlie and I have a partnership, thinking yeah. about the whole place, and we've done it forever, you know, and uh, and we still do. And Todd and Ted. I didn't see them mentioned. Well, they, 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 they have $13 billion each, including pension funds, that uh, our pension funds, that they, they run. And, and uh, so of the $173 billion we had at year end in equities, uh, they had, well, we had 173 bucks. We had another $8 billion in pension funds. So of the 180 or so, they had 26 between them that they're managing. And they got total discretion on that. They don't ask me. At the month end, I look and see what they did. They, they don't do much. They don't do a lot of trading or anything. But I, I look to see what changes they made. And, and uh, Todd, for example, I mean, he, he made a couple of small investments in, in private placement type operations. And... I know what the businesses do, but I can't tell you their names. You know, mm -hmm. just, that's his baby. Was one of those, uh, you made this investment in Oracle and then you sold it, was that something they did? No, I, that was not something they did. That was I, something I did. Yeah, and you said you didn't understand it. That's why I, you sold it. Then why'd you get it in the first place? Yeah, well, that's, 
That's a good question to which I do not have a good answer. <laughs> I know, I, I see development. I know enough about the cloud to know I don't know enough about the cloud. Right, okay. Um, so Barclays put out a note, they said they were lowering the estimates for Berkshire, for EPS. Do you read that stuff? No. Well, I mean, I may read it accidentally, but I don't, I don't seek it out to read, I'll put it that way. But they're, they're, it, it just doesn't make any difference at all. And, uh, I mean, if I spent time reading that, I wouldn't have a time to read 10Ks. <laughs> Uh, we're not going to do anything different. I don't know what we're going to earn. As I put in the annual report, and I really think this is unique, I mean, we do not prepare financial statements monthly for Berkshire. And there's just no other company would do it. But there's no sense doing it. I, I, know, I know where the money is. And I, know what, I know how the companies are doing generally. But what difference does it make? Because I'm not going to try and hit any number for the quarter by you know, having a sale on insurance or doing something <laughs> even worse. Uh, so it, it, it and, and Charlie, I mean, he, he, knows, he knows where we stand and, and we know what businesses are doing well, which aren't, and we certainly know where the money is. Another one, UBS survey of Berkshire investors says the five most important things to them are succession, investment performance, M&A opportunity, share repurchase, insurance margins. Do you read that's that? pretty that no, but that I don't disagree. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm glad that somebody understands this. <laughs> Your own investors. Yeah. Um, well, that's important. You know, 54. Well, if you go back to when I started my partnership in 1956 that Berkshire came out of, there were seven people sitting there at a table uh, having dinner, uh, relatives primarily, and I, I said, "Here's the partnership agreement. It's done under Nebraska law." It's four or five pages, you don't need to read it. But I said, here's a little half page, what I call the ground rules. And I want you to read these. And if you feel okay about that, about the interaction, what the expectations are and all of that sort of thing, then we'll join forces. And if you don't, it's fine. Other people have, you know, but we, don't, we shouldn't be partners. I mean, you know, if I'm gonna have a partnership with somebody, I want it to be compatible. It is, you know, it, and when you have a, public company, you can't control who comes in. I can't control some guy that comes in and thinks we were gonna pay big dividends or split the stock or something like that. So by my actions and my communications and everything, I want to attract the people that, from the public market that I want, and I want to keep the others away. Costco was built. Sol Price, who started the Price Club and that thing, he sat down and figured out the customer he didn't want. And he set up a system that would keep away the customer he didn't want. Who did he not want? He didn't want somebody buying a quart of milk with somebody behind him with a, with a basket of $200 worth of goods waiting for that. So he put in a membership fee. And by putting in a membership fee, he, he killed all the drop-in business, the business that belonged to the 7-Eleven. We want Berkshire to, to keep out people who have expectations about us that are, are different than ours. I mean, good for them, and I hope they find somebody they fit. But, if you're going to run a church, you, you, want, you want your seats to be filled by people that are generally want to listen to your form of religion. And, and you don't want it to change every week and say, gee, I need a new group and I'll go out and talk to a bunch of investors and get them to come to my church this Sunday. Because there's only so many seats in the church. There's a million six hundred and forty-five thousand or so A equivalent shares and those are the seats. And I want them occupied by people that are on the same page I am. Church of Berkshire. Um, it seems like you've got a big weighting in financials, and of course you finally invested in Jamie Dimon's company. Why banks right now? There are businesses I understand, and I like the price at which they're selling relative to their future prospects. I think 10 years from now that they'll be worth more money, and I feel it's a, there's a very high probability I'm right. And I don't think they'll turn out to be the best investments at all of you know the whole the whole panoply of things you could do, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that they won't disappoint me. You said you're surprised that interest rates have been this low this long, but isn't that because of accommodating central banks' policies around the world, A, and how deflationary technology is in society? Do you think that has something to do with it, those two? You can always look back and say, frame up the reasons, but in the end, you know, does that, nobody was telling me, you know, 
if somebody told me 10 years ago what was going to happen in the next 10 years, we could have made a lot of money in the bond market together, you know, but, but it, it's, it, there's always the reason afterwards. Tomorrow's paper will say stocks went down today because of, you know, but they didn't, they didn't write it this morning's paper that stocks are going to go down today. <laughs> you have to know what you don't know, and you have to make sure that what you don't know isn't all important. I mean, you know, if there's four boxes there, you want to get to what is knowable, and, 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 and which uh, is favorable. And there's things that you'll miss out on because they belong in the other three boxes, one of which will be favorable, another one favorable. And uh, the fact that you're missing out on 90% of the stuff doesn't really make any difference if, if the 10% you do is right. Is climate change changing your insurance businesses? No, it doesn't change the insurance business. Does I it mean. change modeling or something in the business? No, it would change our insurance business if we were writing 20-year policies. I mean, if there was something that changed life mortality uh, adversely to the interests of a life insurance company, you're stuck with a policy for 20 years if you write the life insurance policy and it's, you know, you'll, you'll keep paying your premiums if it's adverse to me. That's what's happened in long-term care insurance, for example. But when you write a policy for one year at a time, you see what the developments are and if, you know, it, Cars, for example, uh, are much safer to drive than they used to be. There used to be 15 deaths per 100 million miles driven. Now there's a little over one. On the other hand, they become much more expensive to fix. I mean, that little little side right in the side view mirror, you know, which <laughs> used to cost 10 bucks, you know, now a thousand bucks or something like that. So, so you have things that are changing in terms of if you're writing collision experience uh, insurance, you got to allow for the fact that 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 the uh, windshield, the bumper, all kinds of things, or the, uh, the side view mirror and all that are way more expensive. But if you're writing, if you're writing liability, you know that, the, that people aren't gonna die as often. So climate change is like, climate, climate's been changing. But the, the truth is that you now can buy uh, really big catastrophe limits cheaper than you could buy them in 2000 five or thereabouts, uh, allowing for changes in the dollar and, 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 and concentration of population. So, so, so far, rates have come down. That's the reason we've gotten out of the cat business to a great degree. We were, the, we were a very big writer of cat business 10 or 12 years ago. We aren't out of the cat business because of climate change. We're out because the prices aren't right. Uh, and the world will change, and that's got very serious consequences. But, but it won't change that much from year to year. That, you know, we've done very well during a period of some climate change. <laughs> right. Just a couple more questions before we take a break. You talked about technology advancing faster than our ability to understand it. And I'm wondering if social media and Facebook and Google and Russian trolls coming in, is that maybe an example of that? Are you still worried about that problem? Well, I think cyber poses real risks to humanity, forgetting about the, the problem of even misinformation. I'm just thinking of, you know, we have railroads running over 22,000 miles of track, and some of them are carrying ammonia, and some of them are carrying, you know, chlorine and things. We have to carry them. We have no choice about that. I'm required by law to carry them. And, uh, uh, you know, I would rather... I would rather do that in a non-cyber world than a cyber world. And I would... There are all kinds of things. I, the problem about something like cyber is that it's it's moving and it's it's just unpredictable whether you'll get some crazy guy like stuck the anthrax and you know what they can do uh, becomes magnified. I mean, when when uh, when you saw what you know 19 guys did you know to uh, non 9/11. I mean, it, tools in the hands or potentially in the hands of either crazy individuals, uh, crazy groups, or even a few crazy governments, you know, are really something. And, 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 and we don't necessarily know what all the tools they have are, and that is moving all the time. I mean, you know, again, Einstein said, he said, I know not with what, 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 what weapons World War III will be felt, uh, fought, but World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones, you know, I mean, it's, it's a dangerous world. I don't know if you've been following this, uh, Warren, but um, what do you think of Elon Musk's 
behavior as a CEO? Well, I think it has room for improvement. <laughs> now, he, he, uh, and he would say the same thing. You know, I mean, it, uh, uh, it's just some people have a talent for <laughs> interesting quotes, and, <laughs> and others, others have a little bit more of a blocker up there that says this can get me in a problem. And it, uh, but he's he's a remarkable guy. But uh, uh, I don't see. I just don't see the necessity to communicate. You know, I've never, I, I think I've got seven tweets because a friend of mine signed me up for it and she's called me about a hundred times saying, can I tweet this or that? And I, I've said yes to her seven times, I guess, or something like that. I, I've never actually written one myself. I, I don't even know how to do it. <laughs> Have you talked to Elon ever? Uh, he, he joined the Giving Pledge, so I, uh, once or twice, but that's a lot of years ago. Uh, you know, seven or eight years ago. I've, I've not, I haven't, he hasn't come to our annual gathering, so I haven't seen him for seven or eight years. We'll be right back with Warren Buffett. We're here with Berkshire Hathaway's Warren Buffett, and Warren, we're going to talk a little bit about China, and I wonder if you have something to say to Chinese investors out there. Wan Ying. Perfect. Great accent, by the way. Um, we'll conduct the rest of this in Chinese if you'd prefer. Well, maybe not. <laughs> you said a lot, you speak Chinese a lot better than I do, so uh, maybe we'll stick to English. Um, so uh, let's talk about this, uh, this trade war that's been going on a little bit with uh, China. And I guess I'd like to ask you, do you think that Donald Trump was right in calling out the Chinese government and basically putting them on notice? Yeah, I won't have any comment on, 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 on that. It may, uh, in terms of political... Uh, uh, activity, I don't put my citizenship in a blind, a blind trust. So when the election comes around, I'll, I'll, I'll do something. On the other hand, uh, people will interpret things I say about any, any president, you know, as to some extent coming from Berkshire, and they, and they don't come from Berkshire. You know, I'm just an individual. So I, I, I uh, you know, I think, uh, I'm glad to talk about China, but I can't, I can't talk to you about that part of it. Fair enough. I mean, do you think there was room for improvement then in terms of the trade relationship between China and the United States? Well, I think that China and the United States absolutely are destined to be the superpowers, you know, of beyond my great-grandchildren's uh, lives, and, and will always have be competitors, and will be competitors in in business, we give competitors and ideas, all kinds of ways, and there's no other way it would be. And we just have to make sure that that competition doesn't get get us to a point where we don't realize that the best world is one in which both the United States and China prosper. I mean, that, that we do not want to have an island of prosperity in the rest of the world, uh, envious of us in a, in a nuclear age. And, and China doesn't, Russia doesn't. I mean, we all re recognize the dangers of letting competition get out of control and, and, and become, you can, you can be competitors without being enemies. And, and that's, that's what all powerful nations have to realize over time. I mean, it's different than 200 years ago when you could have some dominant uh, country. And then, uh, they may have done some things that you didn't like, but it didn't threaten the existence of the world. You really threaten the existence of the world, uh, as we know it, if important countries do not constantly recognize that they can compete, they can fight over certain things, but they can't regard it as essentially the equivalent of war. Here's a question from Kevin Chen, who is a Berkshire shareholder and an NYU professor. And he says, and this is sort of along the lines of what you were just saying, Warren, but do you think that U.S. and China will be able to resolve their differences or are conflicts unavoidable? Well, I don't think conflicts are unavoidable, but I think, I think it has to be active thinking on the part of every hugely powerful country. And, and Russia is hugely powerful. I mean, 90 percent of the nuclear arms in the world are between U.S. and Russia. So uh, they... They have to recognize that the best world for them is uh, one where they don't try and grab all the apples, basically. And, and we have to recognize that. And, and, and we can't, in the United States, we, we can't think that either our ideas run the world 
you know, or uh, uh, we start getting aggressive about things, and China can't think that, and Russia can't think that, and, and, and that's obvious. You just have to make things. You got to be sure things don't escalate. To, uh, you know, that World War One, you know, with an archduke. You know, I mean, you get you get these you can get chance incidents, and and you really want to. Uh, I asked one of the presidents one time, you know, in terms of what he would do if awakened in the middle of the night with somebody coming to him and saying, absolutely, you know, somebody else has launched, you know, and would you launch on that? And you've got 10 minutes to decide. And I wouldn't want to have that responsibility, but, but you want to make sure you don't get to that point. Right, right. Would you ever make a big acquisition in China? And if not, aren't you missing a huge portion of? Yeah, the answer is we would. Yeah, we would. Have you looked? Uh, We've been made aware of things, some things, yeah. Are you concerned, um, on the flip side of the coin, are you concerned that the, the rule of law is different, that uh, the accounting might be opaque? Well, I'd, I'd, wa I'd want to be sure I understood the accounting, obviously. In some businesses, that'd be easier to do than others. But, but I know the laws, the customs, uh, the accounting, the people, better in the United States than any place else. So there's some small hurdle in, in many countries to get over, which I can get over. I mean, but I, but I just don't, it's just not as easy as looking at something where I already know the answer, you know, from previous transactions or something of the sort. So, so it, it, it's easier uh, to make a big acquisition in the United States. I have to do more work uh, if I'm looking beyond the borders. But I love the idea of doing it. Uh, when we made the acquisition in Israel a dozen years ago, you know, I didn't know what the tax rates were there. I didn't, I didn't know what corporate law. You know, I, was, I, I suspected that it would all be answered satisfactorily, which it was. But I didn't just automatically know it. It seems like you're more open I, about doing a deal in China than your previous conversations. I don't think so. Uh, no, I, uh, no, it, no, I, 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 I'm, I'm open. Yeah, I, I, okay. we we made, you know, we made two decent-sized stock acquisitions there, and that worked out fine. Those are well, PetroChina and yeah. BYD. BYD, yeah. Yeah, BYD was Charlie's, but right. Charlie's yeah. very well versed on China. Right. But, uh, um, the the trade, the U.S. trade deficit has been widening, and of course, a lot of that has to do with our trade with China. Is that something that worries you? Well, I wrote an article about it for Fortune and the, the, the trade situation many years ago, and when when our deficit got to be large in relation to GDP, <coughs> I don't think it's I don't think it's essential to have a trade balance. But I, I I think that if a trade deficit gets large and and it looks like you have no way out from it, that that can be. A real problem over time. I mean, you're, you know, you're you're shipping little pieces of paper to the rest of the world, and they're shipping you goods. I mean, people are working, making underwear or shoes someplace, and they get little pieces of paper from us. And it gets very tempting if you've done that enough to make sure that those little pieces of paper aren't worth very much over time <laughs> when, they, when they want to cash them for something. So, and you don't want to have. We don't have any problem running trade deficits, but. But if we ran really large ones and we sort of worked ourselves into a box where they were, we, we didn't really have a solution to get the, the numbers down, it could be a problem. And I wrote about it one time. But uh, it's, it's kind of a nice thing, actually. Just I mean, wouldn't you like to have something where you could just send out little pieces of paper and somebody keep supplying you with your food or your, you know, whatever I'm you might? You're all, yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, we call them credit cards yeah, in the yeah, United exactly. States. Exactly. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, and last question: uh, China is facing its slowest growth in nearly three decades. The leadership there lowered the targets, I think, to around uh, six point five percent, six percent. Are you concerned about this slowing growth and the impact on global markets? Well, I don't worry about it in terms of global markets. I mean, uh, China's going to grow a lot uh, over time. I mean, they, when you think of what's happened, well, this is 1949 or whatever, you know, but there's been nothing really like it. I mean, uh, you, know, uh, you, you had 20% of the world's population at that time, perhaps, uh, 
Well, it really hadn't remotely achieved their potential. I mean, they had the intellectual capacity, they had a, a decent soil, all kinds of things. I mean, and, 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 and what's happened there almost is beyond belief. And, and that game's not over, but we've had incredible developments in the United States. I mean, you know, real GDP per capita is six times what it was the day I was born in the United States, six times. And we thought we were a pretty developed country then and everything. Uh, no, my parents wouldn't have believed it. I mean, they, they would have thought, you know, that uh, this kid has really got it made, you know, <laughs> made more in the United States than it, it was true. I mean, we had this tailwind and, and China's had a hurricane behind it, you know, in, 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 the, in recent decades. In a good way. Absolutely. Uh, because you were comparing it to the tailwind of the yeah. hurricane no, at their back. And, yeah, at their back. And, 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 and they've, they have found a way of life that is dramatically different than existed for the billion. There was a billion then, maybe, maybe a billion, two or three, whatever it is now. And, and they have changed uh, a country really of size. That's, I don't think there's ever been anything like it. We've done it too, but it took, a, took, took somewhat longer. I mean, it was, it was a more stretched out. It was a remarkable period, but, but uh, you know, when you go to, I first went there in 1995, uh, and then they regarded it as a miracle, and then I went back 10 years later, and it was a whole different country beyond that. Warren, how would you define true success? Well, I've, I've said many times that, that, that if you get to be 65 or 70 and later, and, and the people that you want to have love you actually do love you, you're a success. I've never seen anybody that reaches that age. I mean, I'm not talking about somebody that's in extreme poverty or pain or something, but I've never seen anybody that, if they have a lot of people that, that love them, that is other than happy. And I've seen some very, very wealthy people that they give testimonial dinners to and name schools after and everything. And nobody, nobody loves them. You know. Their own what? kids would say, he's in the attic, he's in the attic, you know, <laughs> if they ever came. <laughs> What are, say, three pieces of advice you would give to people who are looking to succeed in business? Well, I, uh, by far the best investment you can make is in yourself. I mean, uh, for example, communication skills. I tell those students that come that uh, they're going to graduate schools and business and they, they're learning all these complicated formulas and all that. If they just learn to communicate better, in, both in writing and in person, they increase their value at least 50%. And, you know, I mean, it, 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 uh, if you can't communicate, somebody says, you know, it's like winking at a girl in the dark. Nothing happens, you know, basically. And, and you have to be able to get, get forth your ideas. And, uh, and that's, that's relatively easy. I did it myself with the Dale Carnegie course. Some people wish I'd taken a shorter course now <laughs> in terms of my talking later on. But it, it, it's just hugely important. And you, if you invest in yourself, nobody can take it away from you. I mean, you, you and, uh, the second thing, which I'll get a certain criticism for not living it, but, but I do tell the, those students, you know, that if I gave you a car and it would be the only car you get in the rest of your life, you, you take care of it like you can't believe. Any scratch, you'd fix that moment, you'd read the owner's manual, you'd keep a garage and do all these things. And you get exactly one mind and one, and one body in this world. And, and you can't start taking care of it when you're 50. By that time, you'll have rusted out if you haven't done anything. So you, you should... You should really make sure that you just remember that you just got one mind and body to get through life with and to do the most with it. What about life advice? Well, life advice is, uh, you know, the most important thing, uh, aside from the things I've talked about already, is, is really who you associate with. You want to associate with people that are better than you are. I mean, basically, you'll go in the direction of the people that you associate with, and, and you want to have the right heroes. Uh, you want people, if you want to emulate somebody, you better pick very carefully who you want to emulate. And, uh, and when, obviously, you can't pick your parents. Uh, uh, they're going to have enormous influence on you, but you don't get a choice on that. But you get choices as you go down the line. And you, uh, who, you, uh, who you admire, who you, who, you, who you want to copy, and the most important for most people in terms of that decision is their spouse. It's also important in terms of a partner in business, but the partner in life is, is, is the most important one. You, you want to pick a spouse that's, 
a little bit better than you are. <laughs> and then he or she, and, hope, and you hope they don't f figure it out too fast. <laughs> Biggest mistakes people make when investing? Well, they, they, they try to, they, they, they just don't realize that all you have to do is just buy a cross section of America and then never listen to people like me or read the papers or do anything subsequently. It, uh, they think, they think that because you can trade, you should trade. They, you buy a farm, you buy an apartment house, you can't resell it tomorrow, and, you know, the cost of moving around. Or you, now you get something handed to you, liquidity, you know, which is instant, you can sell, and the, the cost of doing it are pennies you know, compared to other kinds of investment activity. So because they can so easily move around, they do move around, and moving around is not smarter than investing. You have a pretty cool uh, morning routine regarding what you have for breakfast and how prosperous you feel. What is that? Well, uh, that was, uh, I now actually send somebody over to McDonald's, usually to get me something. <laughs> since, since, since the publicity I got from earlier describing my habits at McDonald's, I, I, I now somebody have, the, uh, have somebody go in the office, but uh, that was, that was uh, more for entertainment value. I, I actually eat, I eat exactly what I like to eat. If, if I liked it on my sixth birthday, at my sixth birthday party when we had hot dogs and hamburgers and Coke and ice cream with chocolate. I still like it. And I don't care about anything subsequently. That <laughs> I discovered it all by the time I was six. And if, if somebody had offered me a deal when I was 20 and said, you're gonna live one year longer, you know, instead of living to 88, you'll live to 89 or whatever it may be, if you eat nothing but broccoli and Brussels sprouts and onions and all these things. I know, I, I just said, I'll you know, take the last year off, it probably won't be that good anyway. You know? I mean, so I, uh, I eat what I like to eat. I, 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 uh, I, I'm not venturesome in that area. I like how you lumped in onions with broccoli and Brussels sprouts. Well, I don't know, I, I, I just don't happen to like onions, but uh, no, that, I don't put them in the same category. Okay. <laughs> you and George H.W. Bush, I think. Um, is business school worth it? Depends on the person, and, uh, much more than it depends on the school. I mean, I, I wouldn't worry. Some people are going to get a lot out of advanced education, and some people are going to get uh, very little. And uh, I, I don't even think it's important that every person go to college at all. I mean, uh, we have all kinds of jobs at 70 or so thousand a year, 80,000 a year, that c college training is, is, is not of use. And, and I, I actually was not keen on going to college really? myself. Yeah, my dad. Uh, kind of jolly man do it, he could get me to do anything. But and if they'd had an SAT test in those days, he would have taken the test for me. <laughs> but, but, uh, cause I, I just, I, I was, I, I, I knew I could have a good time and I, I liked investing and I didn't really feel, I, I, I could read the books. Uh, uh, so I don't, you know, it's, it's a big commitment to take four years and the, the cost involved and maybe the loans involved and everything. And I think depending on what your interests are in life, uh, I, I, don't th I don't think it's for everybody. I think it's for a lot of people. Uh, but there ought to be a reason you're going. And I didn't really see much reason. All right, last question. So lightning rounds, there's a few. Um, do you ever drink water? Only under uh, duress. <laughs> what is your favorite all-time song? Uh, it, it's undoubtedly, it, it's my way. What about movie? Favorite movie? Well, I like the Bridge on the River Kwai because of the, the there were a lot of lessons in that. Plus, it was a, you know enormously fascinating Catchy movie. Catchy tune also. Pardon me. Catchy tune also. Yeah, yeah, very. Right. But that the ending of that was uh, sort of the story of life. You know, is is. He created the railroad, <laughs> and, and did, he really, did he really want the, the enemy to come in across it, you know? It, Got it. Favorite book? Well, the favorite book from an investor, the, the book that had the most impact on my life was The Intelligent Investor by Ben Graham. I knew you were going to say that. Yeah. Um, favorite TV show? Mm, it's, it's probably going to be... Uh, uh, it would be Nebraska in some huge bowl game and winning. <laughs> and finally, what do you carry in your wallet and how much money do you tend to carry around? Well, I probably carry uh, 
maybe four hundred dollars. Uh, I I actually uh, my my wife likes to use the cash, so I I just take home uh, a, a chunk of cash every now and then. And then she doles it out. She looks at my billfold and sees whether all the hundreds are gone. <laughs> Sticks a few in there, but uh, it's it's pretty simple. And credit cards. I've got an American Express card, which I got in 1964, but I, I pay cash 98% of the time. If I'm in a restaurant, I always pay cash. It's just easier. Warren Buffett, thanks very much. <laughs> Hello, investors. I'm Zach Guzman. Thank you so much for checking out the Yahoo Finance YouTube channel. Don't forget to click right here to subscribe, and don't forget to check out our live market coverage every day from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern time right here on the Yahoo Finance YouTube channel.